welcome everyone. Thank you so much for coming and particular thanks to our speaker Fausto who's very generously volunteering his time to speak to us today. Thank you very much. Thank you, so I'm going to talk to you today about the way in which thyroid surgery has changed over the centuries and in more recent times to give you a bit of an idea about what we do in thyroid surgery in general. So thyroid surgery is a part of endocrine surgery. So what is endocrine surgery? Well, we are, if you like, the surgical arm of the endocrinologist. What defines endocrinology is the management of organs that produce hormones. And the hormones, by definition, are things that are released into the bloodstream without a duct. Okay, and so organs will be like the thyroid gland, the parathyroid glands, the adrenals, um, and the endocrine pancreas. What do you mean with that? Well, if you think about glands in general, let's say the salivary gland, you're, you release saliva into the mouth via a duct. So there's a duct that leads the product of the gland into another area. Whereas endocrine organs don't have a duct they release their products directly into the bloodstream. So things are then circulated via the bloodstream. So the thyroid gland has no duct. And that has an implication. The implication from a surgical point of view is that all these organs have a disproportionate blood supply. So the pituitary gland has no duct. It's an endocrine organ. And it has to have, of course, a very good blood supply to release its hormones into the bloodstream. The thyroid is exactly the same. And that's what makes thyroid surgery, uh, let's say, uh, interesting. Because, of course, these organs, like the adrenal glands, like the thyroid glands, are very vascular. And we're going to talk about thyroid surgery in particular today. So before we talk about thyroid surgery, we need to talk about who needs thyroid surgery. Now, most of the people in this audience, I'm presuming, are taking thyroxine. But most people take thyroxine because their thyroid has failed not necessarily because a surgeon has removed the thyroid gland, but nevertheless, a significant number of people will have had a thyroidectomy for some reason. So what are these reasons? Well, the, in, in order, if you like, of importance, let's say, thyroid cancer is one reason why you may have to have your thyroid gland removed. If there's a cancer within your thyroid, the key part of the treatment is to remove the cancer. And of course, also to remove abnormal lymph nodes when they are present. We also do surgery in patients who have suspected thyroid cancer because there are still circumstances today where despite a biopsy, you can't say with certainty that the patient has a cancer. And so you have to remove a part of the thyroid gland to exclude a cancer. In the future, that will happen less and less as our diagnostics and molecular markers improve. But as things stand, there are still patients that have to have half of their thyroid gland removed to be sure that they don't have a cancer. Patients with symptomatic goiters. Now, first of all, let's just define goiter. Goiter just means enlarged thyroid. That's all it means. So if you have a goiter, an enlarged thyroid, you may have symptoms. And the reason you may have symptoms is because the neck is a confined space. And when an organ within the neck, in this case the thyroid, enlarges, it will get to a critical moment when its enlargement compresses the other structures that are also in the neck. For example, the esophagus, which is the gullet, which is where food goes. So you may find a patient has an enlarged thyroid and some discomfort on swallowing or a sensation of the food not going down properly. When goiters get very large, they compress, they compress the trachea, which is the windpipe. And in that case, the patient may find that when laying flat or when walk, walking upstairs, they are short of breath. And that is because the windpipe has been compressed. But, so that's a symptomatic goiter. People often say, is a change in your voice a part of a symptomatic goiter? And the answer to that is yes, but if you have a goiter and you have a voice which has changed, then 
you must think that thyroid cancer is a possibility. So that would move into the thyroid cancer as an indication for surgery. Thyroid toxicosis, in other words, an overactive thyroid represents another indication for surgery. Now in the UK, most people with grave thyroid toxicosis, which is an autoimmune condition, have radioiodine because radioiodine has many advantages. It's a tablet, it's, it's, it's safe, it doesn't involve surgery, therefore it doesn't involve an anaesthetic and so on. But there are some patients who, sh who should have surgery or do have surgery rather than radioiodine. And the reasons for that are because the goiter is very big or the patient has bad eye disease, which often accompanies grave thyroid toxicosis, and radioiodine may make eye disease worse where surgery does not. And because radiation in the form of radioiodine means that the patient is radioactive, there are radiation precautions. So if you have young children, it's a problem to have radioiodine, or if you want to become pregnant, or if you are pregnant, you would not want to have radioiodine. So some patients have a total thyroidectomy for thyroid toxicosis. And finally, and I have to say quite uncommonly today, we do a thyroidectomy for cosmetic reasons. In other words, the patient does not have cancer, does not appear to have local compressive symptoms, does not have thyroid toxicosis, but just says, I don't like the look of it. And we're reluctant to do that, generally speaking. But there are certain circumstances where we would agree to do a thyroidectomy for that reason. So those are the reasons why people have a thyroidectomy. And in 2018, let's make it quite clear that thyroid surgery is safe. And you'll see that by the end of this talk. But this was not always the case. So the first documented thyroidectomy occurred in the 13th century in Salerno, which is the world's first medical school, which no longer exists, by the way. And what they did, just to give you an idea of how brutal things were, is they just tied a seton around a goiter. So it, a seton is just a thread around the goiter. So you can imagine that the patient has a large uh, growth coming out of their thyroid, and their solution to that was just to tie a thread around it and pull very hard, like a, or tie a boot lace around it and pull very hard. So that's how thyroid started, thyroid surgery started. There are other reports over the centuries of enucleation, which means scooping out, uh, or tying bits of the thyroid gland off, or burning the thyroid. You can imagine how much fun that was. So that was the 13th century. But everything really changed when we started to understand the anatomy of the thyroid, because in the 13th century, they just saw a lump and tried to deal with it as best they could. But Leonardo da Vinci, in his uh, paintings, often painted women who had had a goiter. And the reason is probably because of iodine deficiency. It was probably quite common for women to have a goiter. And so you find in his paintings, and here's one painting as an example, the Madonna of the Carnation, also known as the Madonna of the Rose, but you could call it the Madonna with the goiter because she has an obvious goiter. And, but that was not uncommon. And Leonardo was a polymath, of course, and he was an anatomist as well. So he's the first person to draw the thyroid gland. Of course, he had absolutely no idea what the thyroid was for. He, all he knew is that he had a significant blood supply, it wrapped itself around the windpipe and the larynx, and they thought, well, maybe it lubricates the larynx. That's what they thought. They had no idea about what it produced or what it really did. So that's really what changed thyroid surgery, understanding the anatomy. So the question is, when we're talking about Leonardo da Vinci, given, given we're on this topic, you may or may not be aware that there is a theory that the La Gioconda, which is the real name of the Mona Lisa, the name of the painting, was in fact of a woman who was hypothyroid because Lisa Gherardini, who is the Mona Lisa, if you like, has many features in her appearance that are in keeping with a hypothyroid patient. And 
there are many academics who have written about this, should you ever be interested. But let's go back to the benefit of having people like Leonardo da Vinci, who are curious people, that gave us some anatomical information. Well, using that anatomical information, over the years, people have started to do anatomical thyroid surgery. So they didn't just tie things out or, or slice it off or burn it. They actually said, we're going to remove the organ. So the first time this was uh, described as a proper operation was Pierre Dessau in 1791 described a thyroidectomy in a 28-year-old woman. And of course, this was a great, a highly celebrated event. And, but sometimes uh, it was, you, one has a certain beginner's luck because his second patient died following the surgery with uncontrolled hemorrhage. And the stories of early thyroid surgery are quite well, I wouldn't say comical, because that, to, a, to a modern surgeon they're comical, but you have to put it into, into the context of its day. But the patients had the surgery and then, then basically didn't do very well. And the description of how the patient succumbed after the thyroidectomy was often vague. Like, the patient had the thyroidectomy and they died of shock. You know, now, shock could be, one of the, could, could be a number of things, but bleeding, of course, would have been a major problem because... The thyroid is very, very vascular. They didn't have instrumentation, which was good at controlling blood vessels. But also they had to operate at an incredible speed because they didn't really have anesthesia. And then you have the problem of they didn't really have antisepsis, so they didn't operate in the sterile field. So you can see the, the challenge of the surgeons of their day. And the, the outcomes and the documented outcomes, so you can imagine the ones that were not documented, the documented outcomes in the 19th century, early 19th century, were dreadful. So much so that in 1850, the French College of Surgeons outlawed, outlawed thyroid surgery. They said, this is illegal. You cannot do thyroid surgery. And it was not only in France. This is a famous quotation of Samuel Gross, who was the professor of surgery at Jefferson. And in 1866, he made this wonderful statement. And that is, he asked the question, essentially, do we think that you can do a thyroidectomy with a reasonable chance of the patient surviving. And he said, all the evidence suggests this is quite clearly no. And he goes on to say that if a surgeon should be so adventurous or foolish to undertake this kind of surgery, they should prepare themselves for a lot of bleeding. And it's very unlikely that a patient will survive the surgery and that therefore no, and this is the interesting thing, he used the word honest. So, well, you remember how healthcare was funded in those times. So he said that no honest or sensible surgeon would engage in thyroid surgery because it was disreputable. But of course, times changed. And in, in uh, middle Europe, if you like, that's really the heart of thyroid surgery in, in, around Switzerland and southern Germany. There's a reason for that, of course. And that is that goiter was very common in the mountainous parts of Europe because of iodine deficiency. So northern Italy, Switzerland, southern Germany and Austria which was where goiter was prevalent. So is iodine deficiency something to do with diet? Or yes. So um, when the UK the equivalent was the Derbyshire neck. So if you, the further you go from the sea, the less iodine there is in the water. And there's still parts of the world, in the developing world, where there is endemic iodine deficiency. So if you live in the Himalayas, you will have that problem. So iodine in salt has resolved the problem, at least in those countries where iodine has been added to the salt. Um, but if it's not, and you have profound uh, iodine deficiency in childhood, then it leads to cretinism because it leads to uh, a, a poor neurological development. And in the adult, it leads to a goiter because the thyroid tries to compensate for iodine deficiency by enlarging. <clears throat> so, in those parts of the world where iodine deficiency was uh, endemic, which is basically the mountainous parts of Europe and other parts of the world, that's where goiter was most prevalent. And so it's inevitable that that's where thyroid surgery was um, uh, most developed. And uh, Theodore Bill Roth published what were considered to be fantastic results in 1861. In other words, only half of the patients died effectively, after a thyroidectomy. But the person who 
transformed thyroid surgery without any doubt is Theodore Cocker. In fact, we still talk about the Cocker incision for thyroid surgery. Now, Cocker was a general surgeon, but he made his name in thyroid surgery because he published a very large series of thyroidectomies with a 1% mortality, which is extraordinary. So extraordinary that there is a citation of a, a UK surgeon from a major London hospital of the day that said he must be inventing his data. It's simply not possible. But Cocker got the Nobel Prize for his services to uh, the thyroid uh, surgery in, in 1909. And in many respects, nothing really much happened of significance after Cocker. For many years, basically, we used the Cocker's techniques to achieve success in thyroid surgery. And then things, really, we got to the 1970s, and we were still essentially using the same techniques described by Theodore Cocker. But things have changed in the last 40 or 50 years. Let's just compare. So in the past, thyroid surgery was done with a large incision. So when I say large incision, even for a relatively small thyroid, the traditional teaching was to make the incision, first of all, to make the incision low, which aesthetically actually seems like a good idea because it, you can't see it. But the problem is that those incisions are at the junction between the neck and the chest, and so therefore they're more, they have a tendency to stretch, so you end up with a stretch scar. Secondly, they're very large, so you make a, a necklace incision like this, so it's almost ear to ear, if you like. Uh, that simply doesn't happen anymore. The incisions now are made higher in the neck because they're under less tension, but also because if you're going to use a smaller incision, you need to be able to get access to the whole of the thyroid gland, and that includes the superior pole of the thyroid gland, which is quite difficult to access through a small incision low in the neck. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that the traditional teaching of the textbooks was that one approached the thyroid gland via a lateral dissection. In other words, you didn't get too close to the thyroid when you were doing the dissection. And the problem with that, or the reason for that, was because there was a fear that you could damage the recurrent laryngeal nerves. And those are the nerves that control the movement of the vocal cords. So that's why, if you lose the function of the recurrent laryngeal nerve, either because you have a cancer which is invading the nerve, or that your surgeon damages that nerve, there is a permanent alteration in the quality of the voice. And there was a fear of this. And if you damage both vocal cords, you lose your voice completely. Now, we can come back to this afterwards, and we will do talking about complications. But the traditional teaching was just stay away from those nerves. And so don't go too far back. Stay, uh, in other words, stay anterior on the thyroid gland and stay lateral so you don't damage them. But the problem with that was and is that if you approach things in that way, you devascularize the parathyroid glands. So you end up with poor parathyroid function. So in the past, we, we talked about a lateral dissection. Now we do a capsular dissection. So we're actually on the thyroid. And that way we can peel off the parathyroid glands. The rule in the past was just try to avoid the recurrent laryngeal nerve. But what we learned about that technique is well, it's a, there's a surgical principle today, and that is if you want to save something and protect something, you need to see it. Whereas in the past, the idea is if you want to save something and protect something, don't see it, just stay away from it. Whereas there is a, there is a consequence to the capsule dissection, and that is, of course, you will get a better result in terms of parathyroid function, and you're less likely to permanently damage the, the nerve. But by manipulating the nerve, perhaps, you have a, a higher rate of a loss of temporary function of the nerve. So, but if you had to choose between a temporary croakiness or a permanent croakiness, you'd take the temporary, wouldn't you? So as a principle, we now identify the, the recurrent laryngeal nerve in every single thyroidectomy. It's, it's negligent not to do so. You can't not see the recurrent laryngeal nerve in modern surgery. And we now have nerve monitoring devices, which is technology, which allows us to confirm that the nerve 
is conducting during surgery, which is a, a nice adjunct uh, to have um, in difficult cases. Then there's the external branch of the superior laryngeal nerve, which I've written there in 1970, you'd say, what? Who, what's that? I mean, why do we need to worry about that? Well, we now know a lot more about laryngeal anatomy, and we now know that that nerve, which is a very fine nerve, situated high in, uh, on the medial side of the uh, superior pole of the viral gland, that nerve controls the tension within your vocal cord. So if you are somebody who um, just lives a normal life and does nothing more than perhaps sing in the shower, then you, you can probably live a very full and happy life without you, the external branch of the superior laryngeal nerve. But if you are a broadcaster, a singer, a professional voice user, you will have, your, your, your life will be significantly adversely affected by the loss of the external branch of the superior laryngeal nerve because um, you, you have a change in the tone of your voice and a change in your pitch. And there's a very famous uh, Argentinian opera singer, um, of Italian extraction called Kerchi, who had a thyroidectomy, lost her external branch and lost the quality of her voice and never, never was never able to uh, sing properly again. So external branch of the, of the superior laryngeal nerve now is routinely sought during thyroid surgery. What about the completeness of surgery? Well, in the past, one removed the thyroid gland. There was a lot of subtotal thyroid surgery in the past. Now we've moved to a total thyroidectomy, and we also understand the accessory thyroid tissue much better and the different anatomical parts of the thyroid, which previously were somewhat ignored. And finally, what about the parathyroids where our attitude has changed? We don't just ignore them. We now identify them routinely, and we preserve them if, we're, if at all possible, and we have the option of autotransplantation, which I'll talk about later. So that's how thyroid surgery has evolved. But let's talk about the bits that uh, are a bit more upsetting, and that's every surgical procedure has some complications. And that's interesting, the use of the word complication. I've often thought that the word complication is insincere. It's rather like uh, military talk. You know, they talk about collateral damage. You know? Oh, we, we bombed that village and, yeah, we're, there was some collateral damage. The collateral damage is killing children and sort of women going down to the well to get water. Complication, I don't know really where the origin of that word is when it comes to surgery. What complication means is because we can't say the word error. We can't say there was a surgical error because not every adverse outcome, which is really what a complication is, is due to an error. So the fact that you have an infection after you have a hernia repair does not mean that the surgeon was negligent or did something intentionally wrong. No, there, there is a, there is a, a, a almost inevitability is probably a bit strong, but there, there are adverse events that can happen in every, every type of operation. And in thyroid surgery, the adverse events, in addition to the adverse events that can follow an anaesthetic, are very specific. So, Thankfully, it's unusual today, in, 19, in 2018, mm -hmm. to die after a thyroid surgery. But it does happen. We still have a number of deaths everywhere, every year in the UK following a thyroidectomy. So, apart from dying, which is very unusual, what are the specific risks that you need to know about? And what we're going to do is I'm going to talk to you about how things have changed in each of these, uh, these adverse outcomes, complications, in the subsequent slides. But essentially they fall into th these categories. Hemorrhage, in other words, you bleed. You, ha you have an operation and after the operation there's bleeding. This happens, it probably happens in about 1% of patients after a thyroidectomy. Obviously there are differences in rates in different centers and so on, but we can talk about that afterwards. Vocal cord palsy, well, we've spoken about that already. 
The nerve that controls the voice box is intimately associated with the back of the thyroid gland. That nerve's at risk. And a number of patients, probably, probably in the order of one and a half percent, maybe even more in general thyroid surgery, will have a permanent alteration in the quality of their voice. The, the rate is lower in, in bigger centers. Hypoparathyroidism, in other words, hypo means under, if you like, as opposed to hyper, which is over. So hypoparathyroidism means that you lose parathyroid function. That's very common in the short term after thyroid surgery, but in the long term, thankfully, it's not so common, but it's still in, it's probably underreported, but uh, the national data suggests that the rate is around 5% or so, 6.1% is older data. So let's talk about bleeding. So if you, if you say, okay, well, I'm gonna have a thyroidectomy, I've been told by my surgeon that there's a 1% or so chance of me having bleeding. Well, what are the risk factors and why does it happen? Well, if you're male, you appear to have a slightly higher risk of bleeding after thyroid surgery. If you, as you get older, it would appear statistically that the risk goes up. If you have thyrotoxicosis, you're more likely to bleed. And the reason for that is because you are hypermetabolic. And the thyrotoxic patient, remember at the beginning we said endocrine organs, by definition, are, have a very, very rich blood supply. Well, you just imagine if the thyroid is having to be, is overactive, it, it'll have an even bigger blood supply. So if you're thyrotoxic, you've got a bigger risk. And then we have patients who are undergoing second operation, so reoperative thyroid surgery, they are more likely to have a, a hemorrhage after surgery. When does it happen? Well, the vast majority, that's the vast majority is wrong, about in excess of 50% of thyroid, post-thyroidectomy bleeds will occur in the first six hours. The vast majority happen in the first 23 hours. So when you have thyroid surgery, there is, a, there is an area of controversy in the UK, well, worldwide, actually, and that is, should we be doing thyroid surgery as a day case? In other words, there's a driver for financial reasons to get patients in and out of hospital as quickly as possible and in some countries the US mainly thyroid surgery is done as a day case procedure in mainland Europe it's very it's, it's uncommon the vast majority of UK surgery and French German Italian thyroid surgery is done as an inpatient which in our practice here in uh, at the Hammersmith it means 23 hour surgery so we try to be, if you like, evidence-based. If you're going to bleed, you're going to bleed in the first 23 hours. So we keep you in, the hosp in hospital for 23 hours, and then we let you go home. Because the chance of you then having a bleed is pretty small. Yeah. So how do we manage this problem? Well, to minimize the risk of bleeding, and let's not forget, a bleed after a thyroidectomy is a life-threatening event. It yeah? doesn't mean if you bleed, you're going to die. It means if you have a bleed in the neck after a thyroidectomy, if it's not managed briskly, in a number of patients, the patients will lose their airway. In other words, they will no longer be able to breathe. And you can't not breathe for very long before you succumb. Okay? So, so this is a great fear of the thyroid surgeon. I bleed after a thyroidectomy. So how can we try to minimize that risk? Well, there are things that we do preoperatively and there are things that we do intraoperatively and postoperatively. So preoperatively, we try to make sure that any patient having thyroid surgery for thyrotoxicosis is euthyroid at the time of their operation. So in other words, that their thyroid function is normal. And this applies to patients who aren't thyrotoxic that because they have um, Graves' disease, their patients are hypothyroid, for example, and have a goiter. So they're taking thyroxine and they have a goiter. You, we would make sure routinely that the thyroid function tests are normal on the day of surgery or in the day, days immediately before surgery. So that's important. We try to reduce the blood supply to the thyroid gland if 
<coughs> in thyrotoxic patients because even though it's, let's say, unproven, like lots of things are unproven in surgery, there is a, a, a received wisdom that if you can reduce the blood supply to the thyroid gland in a thyrotoxic patient, the operation will be less risky. We do this routinely in all our patients. When you're going to have a thyroidectomy, the last thing you want is to have any problem with your coagulation. Aspirin, which is taken by a large number of patients as a prevention for stroke, or, or if you have an arrhythmia, we take aspirin to reduce the risk of strokes. Or if you have a cardiac history, perhaps you've had a coronary stent, then patients are on antiplatelet agents like aspirin and like clopidogrel. These drugs for a surgeon that's going to undertake a thyroidectomy are bad news because uh, the patient just oozes. And there is one further category. I can't see any Orientals in the, in the audience here. But Chinese medicine often includes things that affect your platelet function. Like omega-3 affects your platelet function. And you can get some bad surprises. Because often patients, when you ask a patient, are you on any regular medication? They say, no, I'm not, not nothing. But they forget to tell you that they take Chinese medicine and dietary supplements that contain omega-3. Omega-3 uh, makes you ooze. So once again, you don't, you've got to ask specifically whether the patient's taking those because that can increase your risk of bleeding. Now what do we do in, to manage the situation, risk manage the problem uh, and minimize the risk to the patient? Well, you need protocoled perioperative care. So if you have a thyroidectomy in a place like the Hammersmith, we have a group of nurses who have been, well the ward, the ward where we do thyroid surgery has been managing the same pathology for the last 50 years, which is fantastic. And the nurses that manage thyroidectomy patients on our ward have incredible incredible experience in managing these patients. So when there's a problem, thankfully it's not very common, but when there's a problem, there's a protocol, there's a system. Systems in place, they know exactly what to do. They know exactly who to call and how to manage the problem. So you need close observation and you need to have a system in place. We don't give patients non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, which again are like aspirin or Voltarol or ibuprofen because they affect your platelet function. Again, a risk, avoiding risk. And then the question that I'm asked every time by patients and in this sort of forum, what about a drain? My surgeon used a drain. Well, we don't use drains anymore. We haven't used drains, or big centres don't use drains, haven't used them for at least two decades. And the reason is because if you go and look at the, dry, the, the, the evidence, drains actually make no difference. If you bleed, the drains clot off. So you don't, they can give you a false sense of security. You look at the drain, you know, there's nothing in the drain, so the patient can't be bleeding. Well, that's not right, because they can still have a, a, a swelling in the neck due to bleeding but there'd be nothing in the drain. So just to clarify, when do we use a drain? We only use a drain if there's a very large dead space. In other words, we remove a large goiter, like in this lady here, and then after the removal of the goiter, there's a very big space, and that will tend to get filled with uh, serous fluid. So in those cases, we might use a drain, but even then, we, we wouldn't do it automatically. So what can we do during the operation to minimise the risk of bleeding? Well, it's all about technique. And it's, a, it's about being taught properly how to do the operation so that you can minimise that risk. And I underline that, minimise that risk. It's, it's, nobody has the gift of infallibility. But you can restrict the risk to the patient by having a very sound technique. And now we have technology which helps us too. Uh, we've got... Uh, hemostatic devices which we can use during surgery which aren't necessarily going to make the bleeding less frequent. I don't think that's proven but what it does do is allows you to um, work more swiftly 
in the control of the blood vessels around the thyroid gland, which is a good thing. So what's the evidence for the harmonic scalpel and the ligature device? Shorter operating time. People claim that it improves the, or decreases the risk of hypoparathyroidism, but that's not a robust data. So basically, it's fair to say that the hemostatic device technology is, is, is very good. There's no doubt about that, but it, and it saves time. That's the main effect, but doesn't necessarily produce less complications. So what about the vocal cord palsy? Here's another uh, thing which has bec was very common in the past, but now is decreasingly common. Now, the, one of the problems we have with vocal cord palsy is knowing how frequently it actually really happens, because the only way you're going to know is if after the thyroid surgery, you perform a laryngoscopy. In other words, the patient's larynx or vocal cords are assessed for movement. And if you do that, you find that tempor temporary loss of movement is actually not that infrequent, even in the best centers. But the chance of you having a permanent change in the quality of your voice, in other words, permanent loss of movement of one of your vocal cords, is somewhere between one and three or so percent probably in national data. That's, that's the real world. If you go to the very big centers that perform large numbers of thyroid surgery, uh, thyroid operations, the risk is less than one percent, and that's what we quote. Um, one of the problems, of course, is that if you don't look for it, you, if you don't look, you don't find. And if you don't look, you don't find, therefore you don't have an opportunity to reflect on your own practice and what, try to work out what it is you're doing wrong to mean that your patients are getting this complication. And one of the things you need to understand about surgeons and doctors in general, we're no different to anybody else. We don't like to wash our dirty linen in public. So if you have complications, you don't see lots of surgeons publishing their bad results. It's just not what you do, is it? You know, Coca-Cola doesn't, Coca-Cola doesn't uh, spend its time telling you that fizz is not good for you and that it ruins your teeth. They tell you about how wonderful it tastes. Now, nerve monitoring is, again, the technology that's arrived to help us, and this allows us now to uh, monitor the function, the, the, the conduction of the uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve during the operation, which is all a nice thing to have, especially in, when the surgery gets complicated. The, unfortunately, when they've assessed the uh, use of the recurrent, la the, the, the recurrent laryngeal nerve uh, monitoring, they've never been able to prove categorically that it reduces the rate of permanent voice change. But what's interesting is when they've done the largest study of its type in Germany, what they found instead was that the rate of voice change was all to do with the amount of thyroid surgery that the surgeon performs. In other words, the more thyroid surgery you do, the less likely you are to have a change in the voice with or without the nerve monitor. And there's a graph showing it. As you do more thyroid, as you do more thyroidectomies, this is British national data. As you do more thyroidectomies, the rate of uh, vocal cord palsy goes down and down and down. But we never reach the point of infallibility, as you can see. So, what about the parathyroid during surgery? Well, I said previously, in in the in in the nineteen. Uh, in, in, the, in the early part of the 20th century, so in Cocker's time, they really didn't have a great understanding of parathyroid function. What they did do is, well, Cocker taught that you just uh, try to, try to um, stay on the surface of the thyroid gland. That was his teaching, and not remove the back of the thyroid gland, so it's a subtotal thyroidectomy, and therefore you preserve parathyroid function. Then over the decades, until the 1970s, the view was you should try to preserve the parathyroids if you could. But the reality is that because of the 
the technique, the rate of hypoparathyroidism was still very high. And that one of the problems is that thyroid parathyroid glands have a very tenuous blood supply. So just the manipulation of the parathyroid gland or its blood supply can mean they, they lose function. Now we have, a, better, we have a, a greater understanding of the anatomy of the parathyroids. We have a surgical technique which is on the capsule of the thyroid gland with the help of the hemostatic devices which allow you to do that perhaps even better. We preserve parathyroid function when at all possible. But we have the added thing that when the parathyroids are not functioning or not obviously not intact or their blood supply is not intact, we can auto-transplant. So why, you might ask, because somebody always does, why is it that you can't preserve the parathyroids? What's the big problem? Well, sometimes they're sitting very high on the thyroid. So that you can't even see the blood supply or they could be embedded within one of the clefts of nodules of the thyroid gland. So you can't preserve them, which is obviously a problem. And then sometimes the blood supply gets compromised by your technique in preserving the recurrent laryngeal nerve. So it is a problem. Parathyroid function is a problem in thyroid surgery. But again, you can get around the problem. This is just a graphic to show you the problem that you may encounter. So is that, is that showing? Yeah. So this is a parathyroid gland, an inferior parathyroid gland sitting very high on the, on the thyroid. So to preserve this, you'd have to preserve the whole of the tiny, tiny blood supply all the way down to here. And that's difficult. So that's a difficult one. And this is a, an, a superior parathyroid gland where the blood supply is coming back from, from on the thyroid gland. And the act of running along the recurrent laryngeal nerve has compromised the blood supply to it. And this is a, a, real, a real world photograph. So there's no pedicle here, you can't see it. And here, the, you lose the pedicle if you go across that. So what do we do for autotransplantation? Well, there are different techniques. We use, um, I think we're probably the only people in the UK that use this actually, the, an injection technique where we, sus we create a suspension of the parathyroid gland in, uh, in solution and then inject the parathyroid gland into the sternomastoid, which is this large muscle in your neck. I won't go into this much more. So, I've alluded on several occasions to the issue of volume of surgery and outcomes. And I'm just going to quote you the, the, probably the pioneer, the pioneer of the studies of, of uh, volume and outcome in thyroid surgery. And you'd be interested to know that next year there is a whole conference in Granada organized by the European Society of Endocrine Surgery on volumes and outcomes in endocrine surgery. So it's such a big topic. In other words, in 2018, should, we, should surgeons that don't do a lot of an operation be doing it anymore? If we can demonstrate quite clearly that if you perform the same operation frequently, you're likely to get better. I mean, you don't need to be an astronaut, do you, to realise that if you do something a lot, you get better at it. If you had a Ferrari... Would you, would you take your Ferrari to a Ferrari garage that f fixes only Ferraris? Or would you take it to a very good mechanic who fixes all cars? So even the very good mechanic, it's a tough question, isn't it? But so this is a question that the surgical fraternity has to face all the time because also there are logistics of, co of centralization and difficulties in centralizing surgical care. But Julian Sozo is the person that first studied this and published it and showed and tried to break up in the United States surgeons into their volume of practice. And basically, it, the, the, the patients with the lowest, the, the surgeons with the lowest complication rates are the ones who did the most surgery. And this has been reproduced over and over and over. In 2007, Michael Yeh and his colleagues, and the first author was Stavrakis, actually that's a misspelling, showed that you need to be doing 100 procedures to be in the Premier League of neck endocrine surgery. And of course, what's interesting in the United States is that people only sit up 
and listens, not only in the United States, but here too, I guess, people sit up and listen when there's a cost implication. So if you have complications, the complications are not free because you spend longer in hospital, for example. You end up having more post-operative visits and so on. And you sue less. So as a consequence of all this evidence which has been accumulated over the years, all the national guidelines that talk about thyroid surgery say the same thing. Whether it's the British Thyroid Association, the American Thyroid Association, the European Thyroid Association, they all say the same thing. When you're going to have a thyroidectomy, you should have an experienced thyroid surgeon. But they don't tell us what an experienced thyroid surgeon is. Because if you ask a surgeon, are you an experienced thyroid surgeon? You'd say, yeah, yeah, I'm an experienced thyroid surgeon. But what defines it? We don't know. So we, uh, in some environments, in some societies, have tried to put a number to it. And in the UK, essentially, we say 30 thyroid... We've, we set the bar actually very low. We say 30 thyroidectomies a year makes you an experienced thyroid surgeon. There are two surgeons in my department I'm one of them, and neither of us perform less than 150 a year. So what are we? Are we experienced or are we very experienced? But is 30 the right number? Well, I'll leave you to decide. So in summary, this is the last slide you're pleased to hear. Thyroid surgery has changed over the years, thankfully. So we're no longer tying boot laces around thyroids. Um, you can it, thyroid surgery today is safe, mortality is very low, and you can, risk, you can minimize the risks of, thyroid, of all the complications in thyroid surgery by meticulous attention to detail in the preoperative workup, in the surgical technique, and then you can minimize the, uh, the adverse outcome by having good post-operative management as well. But the interesting thing is, having discussed the technology changes in thyroid surgery, it's probably still the case that the biggest determinant in the outcome in thyroid surgery is the training and experience of the surgeon that performs the operation. Thank you very much. It's fascinating. If anyone's got any sort of immediate questions they'd like to ask straight after the talk, then we can maybe take a few and then and then move on to the break. Caroline. Um, you mentioned that uh, they did a rational incision and then they had a surgery to remove the thyroid. What do they do now? So it's not so much the lateral incision, it's the lateral approach. You have these big, broad incisions low in the neck. But what they would do is the incision would be the, let's say a traditional cocker incision, but they would stay as, l l l as lateral as possible, so stay away from the thyroid gland because they feared damaging the nerve. So that's, that, that's the sense of the lateral incision. Yeah. The incision the, the incision's still the same, but the approach to the thyroid was different. There's no doubt that um, physicians referring a patient to surgery will be affected by what they perceive as the risks of surgery. Now, as the risks of surgery have gone down, in the case of thyroid surgery, for example, the threshold may have changed. But that's, that's natural because 
uh, if you referred a patient for thyroid surgery, let's say for grade cytotoxicosis, and the patient regularly came back, if they come back at all, uh, with a change in voice and hypoparathyroid, then when you see your next patient with grave cytotoxicosis, you'd be thinking, mm, I'm not sure surgery is a good idea because the patients appear to have complications. So in a way, uh, as surgery gets better, inevitably there's going to, the patients, more patients will be offered surgery. In the case of grave thyrotoxicosis, there are two things I'd say. Um, as far as taking thyroxine is concerned, patients that have radioiodine usually end up on thyroxine anyway. So whether you have surgery or you have radioiodine, you end up on thyroxine. There was a, there was a fashion in the very commons for subtotal thyroidectomy in Graves patients, in other words, leaving some thyroid behind to reduce the, the need for thyroxine. But in fact, it's such a, a imprecise science that the, pa the, the patients would often end up on thyroxine anyway or end up with a recurrence because you left too much thyroid. That I think I've covered everything. Is there anything I haven't covered there? I'm, a, I'm just interested in, uh, I, I have growth disease. I, in 2010, I had a TT and my endocrinologist said that um, it would cure my growth disease and that I couldn't tell <coughs> carbimazole long term. And actually, I've met people who've been on carbimazole for eight, ten years longer. So I'm just interested in why there's that kind of discrepancy in terms of kind of treatment. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, it's interesting. Around the world, things are done differently. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if you have Graves' thyrotoxicosis in the UK, most patients... Oh, my, I don't want to be, I want to be corrected. <laughs> Most patients in the UK are put on, are put on antithyroid medication typically for between a year and 18 months. That's the UK practice. And then about half will go into remission and uh, others won't. And some that go into remission then recur. In the United States, they very commonly give radioiodine at the time of diagnosis. They won't say, let's, let's put you on antithyroid medication for a year and a half. They say, I'm just going to give you radioiodine. So the fact that half of the patients would go into remission doesn't matter. We'll give you radioiodine. If you have Graves' thyrotoxicosis in Japan, they do not use radioiodine. And they put you on antithyroid medication, well, maybe even for life, but basically until it burns out, which can be many decades. Now, the reason for that that some patients do have surgery in, in, in Japan, of course. But the reason for that is because in Japan, the use of radiation therapy is very strictly controlled. So just to give you an idea, patients with thyroid cancer don't even get radioiodine after thyroid cancer care, thyroid cancer surgery. So there, there are cultural differences around the world. And in Germany, the, the, the threshold for surgery will be different, very different to the threshold for surgery in the UK. So in answer to that, so you have regional, you have national differences, regional differences, and then you have personal experience. So in other words, the endocrinologists will have a personal, uh, prejudice is probably not the right word, but they'll have, they'll have a personal take on it. There are some endocrinologists who are more likely to refer for surgery than others. And I think, I think that is to do with the, the, the the service available to them. So if their surgeon tends to have reasonably good results and the patients come back and say, you know, that was a great experience. The scar's barely visible. My voice is normal. I don't take any additional medication and I feel better. I feel happier with this situation. Whereas if, of course, he has loads of patients to come back and say, I, 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 don't, I, didn't, I didn't like the experience, then they'll change their minds. So I think that the, the, re the, the, the reason things differ is simply because the, the clinicians have different experience. And I guess to add to that, there's, there's not necessarily a right answer. There's definitely no right answer. There's definitely no right answer. In, in the UK, uh, um, I think specifically for Graves, I think I may have said it already, that the vast majority of people have radioiodine the vast majority. The, the minority are the patients that fit the criteria for surgery. Big goiter, bad eyes, uh, 
pregnancy or let's say, let's say you're a woman in your mid to late 30s, you really want to start a family. If you have radio ID and you can have to postpone things for maybe six months or more, you'll feel a bit uncomfortable about it. And let's not forget that, you know, fertility uh, drops as you get older. So the last thing you want to do is take even, put even more delays on your desire to start a family. So you'll go for surgery. So it's, and, and there, are, it, there are, of course, personal, the patients have personal prejudice. For example, radioiodine for, for graves is very safe. It's very safe indeed. And yet the idea of oh, radiation, I'm going to be irradiated, scares you. So there, all these factors come into play. And I think the best services are the ones that have a multidisciplinary type clinic. I mean, I would say that because that's what we have. But where the patient has the opportunity, sometimes the endocrinologist will say, will you please talk to this patient about surgery? Not because they want to refer the patient for surgery, but so that the patient can make an informed choice. And I think we're in 2018. When I, it, you know, I'm, I, maybe I'm getting old, but I can remember in my own professional lifetime, which is basically 25, 26 years as a doctor, where the patients weren't really given a choice. I mean, they really weren't. Uh, you've, got, yeah, you've got this um, problem and you need, you need this operation, it's all going to be fine and uh, we'll, list, we'll get it sorted out for you. Today is very different. Today is different because we have a, 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 an ethical, a moral and legal duty to uh, provide informed consent to the patient. So the patient has the consent to the treatment that they're going to receive with information and real information and the best information really will come from your clinician not um, I, I know that the internet's powerful now and you, there are some ways of getting good information from the internet but your clinician has a duty to explain to you so i have plenty of patients that are sent to me by the team that i sit and i explain to them what i've explained to you which is this is surgery this is what you can expect, and I, despite my best efforts, and I don't have the gift of infallibility, so this could happen to you if you have surgery. So you have to make that decision with that information to hand. You may have an ugly scar. It's not common, but it may happen. So you have to, you have to uh, uh, present things in that way today, and I think that um, <clears throat> probably uh, society is more litigious than it was before, so uh, poor outcomes are less tolerated. So it's very important that patients are given all the information available before they make a choice, whether it's radioiodine, whether it's surgery, whether it's antithyroid medication for life. I mean, let's not forget, antithyroid medication comes with significant complications. Risks, sorry. Of course, it's because medicine, it's, they don't work complications with drugs, but risks. You know, you, let's not propathyuracil, which is the alternative drug to carbimazole, comes with the risk of liver damage, significant liver damage. So um, that's not good. Carbimazole comes with the risk of immunosuppression. That's not good either. It's not common, but it can happen. So uh, there's nothing that you do in medicine, almost, that is risk-free. And I think the, the problem is that understanding risk is not, is not easy. It's not easy for the doctors, let alone for the patients, to try to get their head around so you say this could happen. Does it happen? Yeah, there's no such thing as certainty, is there? No. Yeah. We just have a couple of more questions. Um, I can see you at the back, Beverly. If Judith had her hand up before, so um, Judith and Beverly, and then if we have a bit of a break. Okay. I think one's only a, a quick question. Uh, well, I was just curious that um, you didn't touch on robotic surgery. Uh, what are your views on that? Is it catching on? Well, there's an example. of It comes back to... Uh, regional regional differences so robotic surgery for those who don't aren't, aren't aware of it is the use of a, a, a robot to assist in the surgery and the advantage of the robot is that you can do an operation through the axilla do it through here and remove the thyroid gland without having to have a scar on the neck now this is a popular technique in very few places in the world uh, 
the place where it's most commonly performed is in Korea. The, in the UK, it's never really taken off. We're, we're the only centre that does a robotic thyroidectomy, to my knowledge, in the UK. And because I have a colleague who has an interest. But we do very few. And we select the patients with care. It hasn't taken off. Why? Because the operation takes too long. The robot costs a million pounds. The disposables cost thousands of pounds. Now, in the great scheme of things, for healthcare, you might argue some drugs are extraordinarily expensive, but we still use them. But thyroid surgery is never going to go robotic in the UK. The benefits are questionable. A total thyroidectomy is, in, in, in patients with the body habitus of a typical UK patient, unlike a uh, lovely Korean uh, super slim patient, uh, are, uh, a total thyroidectomy is quite difficult. So in the UK, it hasn't taken off. In the US, the, the FDA have removed the, removed the approval for a total thyroidectomy. So essentially, it's not going to happen. What is happening is transoral thyroid surgery. Yep, just imagine that. So you can do a thyroidectomy with incisions through the bottom lip. So that is, that is becoming more popular, pioneered in Thailand and performed by enthusiasts in various parts of, of the world, but um, it's not going to take off in, in the UK either because our threshold for surgery in the UK is much higher than it is in, re in the rest of Europe. So we perform probably around 11, I don't know, between 11 and 12,000 thyroidectomies a year in the UK with a population of 60 million. In Italy, uh, the same population, they do 45,000 thyroidectomies. In France, they do 40,000. In Germany, they do 90,000 thyroidectomies for a population of 75 million. So the threshold for surgery is very different. So we don't operate on people with thyroids that have got nothing wrong with them or are very small, whereas in some cultures, say in France, the patient will say, I have a nodule in my thyroid, I'd like to have it removed. They have surgery. So we, would, we don't have the type of patients that would be suitable for a transoral thyroidectomy in our practice. That's amazing. There is so much around the world. Beverly, you did the last question. Is there any um, reason why if you would operate on somebody with an autoimmune thyroiditis, if it wasn't, you know, wasn't going away, would you operate on if you have autoimmune, so autoimmune thyroiditis falls into two categories. It's autoimmune thyroiditis where your thyroid's overactive, which is Graves' thyroid toxicosis. And there's an autoimmune thyroid disease, which is the more common one, where you end up with an underactive thyroid. Now, patients that have this type of thyroiditis, which is, which is commonly called Hashimoto's thyroiditis, these patients normally don't need to have their thyroid gland removed because the problem is not that the thyroid has something wrong with it, it's just that the thyroid isn't working. So the thyroid itself isn't usually cancerous. It isn't usually giving local compressive symptoms because Hashimoto's thyroid, thyroids tend to not be very large. Um, so the thyroid can be left alone. Oh, and that's a really challenging one. And the reason it's challenging is because the symptoms that you can encounter when you have Hashimoto's thyroiditis are often related to an inflammatory effect. So it's not the mass effect. It's not that the thyroid is enlarged and it's pushing. It's just there's an irritation around the thyroid gland. And there are, you're quite right, there are some patients who find it very troublesome. The good news is it usually burns out. So that inflammatory effect is temporary, usually. Unfortunately, that temporary can be years, but it is usually temporary. And we do have the option of treating it with anti-inflammatory medication. Very rarely do we ever give steroids for that, but you can use anti-inflammatory medication, which uh, can help deal with those symptoms. But we're reluctant. I personally am reluctant to offer thyroid surgery to somebody with, with Hashimoto's thyroiditis 
who's living a very full and happy life on a small dose of thyroxine. And remember, if I take away the thyroid, what will, I, what will have I achieved? They'll still need to take thyroxine. The only difference is that they won't have a thyroid. And they may, may, lose some of those local irritation symptoms. But surgery is not, especially as you've seen today, all this talk's been about risk and complications. Surgery is not risk-free. So if you were my sister, I would say only have an operation if there's a definite benefit. Because surgery is a balance between risk and benefit. And if the, if the benefit is questionable, well, the risk is always going to out, outweigh them. If you, have, if you have a thyroidectomy for thyroid, thyroid cancer, well, there aren't, really, there aren't no real alternatives to a thyroidectomy in thyroid cancer, so you have to face the risk. But if there's an alternative treatment for, let's say, Hashimoto's thyroiditis. So in other words, I've got a little bit of irritation and I can take a tablet which might help a bit. Always take the tablet. Unless, of course, the tablet has side effects that um, <laughs> patrols them. Oh, yeah. You get scarring after a thyroidectomy. That's why reoperative thyroid, sur thyroid surgery and parathyroid surgery is far riskier. With, uh, it comes with your higher risk of complications or adverse outcomes, whatever you want to call them. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So, one more question. Um, how do you get from your presentation, it was a slide that mentioned the, um, in the risk management, um, something linked with bipolar. Ad oh, I think it's advanced bipolar oh. di uh, um, hemostatic. So the, the hemostatic devices, the blood, the, 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 the devices that control uh, bleeding, there are two types of diathermy. One's monopolar and the other one's bipolar. It's not bipolar as in okay. mental illness. It's just it's bipolar. Let's, uh, let's have a break for the next sort of 30 minutes or so.